and then uh, we will define adverse events, complication and management of complication and conclusion. Um, please feel free to stop me anytime to make any question. Um, we will try to, to do a dynamic, to have a dynamic event uh, rather than, you know, formal, the usual formal event. So any question, anytime is more than welcome. We'll stop and we'll answer. So complication in endoscopy occur. Complication is part of, ge of the game. Whatever you know, you do in endoscopy, uh, you try to be very careful uh, in therapeutic endoscopy. <clears throat> you try to avoid complication. Despite everything you do, you will have some complication if you perform therapeutic endoscopy because there is no one who performing therapeutic endoscopy that never had a complication. That's impossible. So what is important is to recognize the complication and to take care of the complication. So it's important to have a plan in place before you start the therapeutic procedure and always think about how you would eventually handle the complication if these occur. Um, so if you start the resection um, just or a dilatation, just always have on the back of your mind that the surgeon may, might be need to be aware that you're starting a complex procedure. Uh, if the complication happened, then it's very important, if it's possible, to spot the complication as soon as possible, because these many a times improve the outcomes of the complication. And um, it is so important to respond promptly to complications. So once you identify the complication, so put everything in place to manage the complication as well as you can, and we'll see how this will happen. Now, another very important thing, which seems obvious, is that we have to consent the patient before the procedure. And by consenting the patient, it's not just take a signature and go through the procedure, but it's also explaining what the risks are. Um, when I consent my patient, even for a gastroscopy or a diagnostic colonoscopy, I always mention that there is a little risk of bleeding, a little risk of uh, perforation, and then I tell them that in case of bleeding, we might stop the bleeding, and in case of perforation, the worst case scenario is, is surgery, although it's extremely elective to happen. But patients uh, really appreciate when you're honest and you tell them what are the complications. So please, 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 the important, really important key factor here is to have an open, and clear communication with the patient for all kinds of procedure you're going to perform. Um, in particular, for therapeutic procedure, complex procedure, you really need to go through complication because patient needs to know what the risks are before the procedure and how you would eventually handle this risk before the procedure. And now in my hospital, we perform ESD or dilatation, we see the patients in clinic beforehand, we have a chat and we ask them to consent the, the, sign the consent for uh, in the outpatient clinic. And during the complication, once you detected the complication, you uh, manage the complication uh, as best as you can, then once the procedure is finished, you need to tell the patient what happened. And uh, if you admit the patient, then you need to see the patient every day. This is uh, what has been uh, called during a meeting, I will never forget, by Professor Fockens, the best friend role. Why? Because if, let's say, you perform a dilatation you, of the uh, esophageal stricture, you make a, a perforation of the esophagus and you have to admit the patient, then what you want to do is to see the patient every day. No matter what, you go to the uh, ward and you see the patient every day. Even if it's, there is another consultant covering the ward, you need to face your, show your face. So this is why the patient uh, is like become um, your best friend for hopefully a few days. And the other important thing that not many people unfortunately mention is the second victim. And this I think applied mostly to the younger generation because it is well known now, um, and has been described for the first time in uh, uh, 2000 by Dr. Wu, 
that yes, the patient is the first victim because he is the victim of a complication. But then the doctor who usually feel very responsible for the complication is not as a second victim. And there is uh, all the psychological events um, that the second victim goes through that are were defined. So there is a first stage where the doctor say how and why this happened, uh, and then how did they miss and what could I have done to prevent it? And then uh, what other people think, what people in the hospital, colleagues would think of me. Uh, and then there is the phase where the doctors start get worrying, uh, I might get fired, and and then he go and seek uh, colleague support to so discuss his complication with several colleagues, which by the way is a good thing. Um, and then there is the last stage where either drop out and say, oh, this is too much, I can handle these complications, um, I'm, I'm not going to do therapeutic endoscopy anymore, or, and this has happened many a time, is the, the second is the, 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 the doctor uh, learn the lesson, learn to handle this complication, improve himself, and move forward and gain experience. So please, um, you can, you're more than welcome to check all these publications related to the second victim, especially the, the young uh, gastroenterologists who are starting uh, performing therapeutic endoscopy. Now, Definitions. Definitions are very important. So a complication can be defined as an adverse event and as an incident. The adverse event is an event that prevents completion of the planned procedure or results in an admission of a prolongation of existing hospital uh, admission or another procedure like surgery uh, of the patient. So for example, I'm going to do, uh, I'm doing, uh, uh, again, a dilatation. I make a perforation, and then the, the patient has to stay to the in the hospital for a week under observation, or a patient goes through surgery, um, and this is an adverse event. Uh, an incident is when uh, uh, there is an unplanned event that does not interfere with completion of the planned procedure or with the plan of care meaning that we perform a colonoscopy, we reject the polyp, the polyps are bleeding, we place a clip, we stop the bleeding. That was an incident. And then we carry on and nothing different happened to the um, procedure or to the uh, plan of care of the patient. Now, um, we move now to the complication and the procedures. So I, th I thought it was, interesting to start from the diagnostic procedure because yes, diagnostic is diagnostic, it's very easy, everyone can, of us can do diagnostic procedure, but still they have some complications which are very rare and the majority of time they're caused by sedation and uh, analgesia. So usually we, um, those are uh, linked with cardiopulmonary adverse events. So you have uh, uh, patient in advanced age most of the time with uh, several uh, comorbidities. So pulmonary adverse events, they include uh, hyposemia and uh, hypercapnia, both caused by sedation, which decrease uh, the ventilation, so hypoventilation. And also mm, the other complica uh, complication may be aspiration pneumonia. So many times um, I still see um, colleagues that perform gastroscopy, there is food in the stomach and they carry on performing the gastroscopy. This is not really uh, advisable. One, because you know the food can cover some uh, abnormalities in the stomach. And two, because the food can come back um, in the esophagus and then goes down in the uh, airways and this can cause uh, aspiration pneumonia. So please, if there is food in the stomach, just stop the procedure, reschedule for the day after. Or if it's an urgent procedure, then just give metoclopramide or domperidone to the patient and uh, repeat the procedure after a after few hours. Cardiac adverse events are hypotension, uh, which is usually caused by the um, sedation or hypertension, a vasovagal reaction. Uh, hypertension uh, can, can can be caused by anxiety 
or uh, uh, by hypotension. And um, arrhythmias, it's, uh, someone can think that it's uh, very rare, but actually arrhythmias during the procedure are quite frequent but uh, they are mostly in keeping with uh, atrial or ventricular ectopic uh, beats or atrial fibrillar uh, or uh, supraventricular supra, uh, tachycardia, which is uh, something that resolves spontaneously. Um, angina, um, it may happen, very rarely happen, uh, but it happens when you have uh, a reduced uh, myocardial perfusion due to bradycardial or hypotension, but I mean, you manage the angina with a nitroglycerate as usual. Uh, now, perforation, I put it in red because it's always a quite a stressful situation. So, perforation for diagnostic colonoscopy is extremely rare 0.3% uh, to 0.01%, and of course, increase with the in therapeutic procedure. So how does perforation happen with diagnostic procedure? First of all, when you try to pass the corners uh, of, the, of the colon or part of uh, when a colon is quite angulated and you try to pass it, um, push it blindly, so push the scope through the wall and you can see that the, the wall change coloration, it goes from a white, uh, from a pink color to a white color. That's very unsafe. Um, because you are basically applying pressure on the colonic wall, and this uh, can result in perforation. Ovarian insufflation can, uh, and bari bariotrauma can cause perforation. So if you see that the, the colonic wall is start bleeding and there are some scratches, it means that there is too much gas inside the bowel. Now, we're now using CO2. So this is not... Um, this is a very rare uh, event, but because before with the oxygen, it, it happened um, more often. Uh, but still, if you see that this is happening in the patient in pain, then you want probably to uh, suck the CO2, uh, reduce the tension. And uh, also when you pass the uh, channel, through the channel, the uh, devices, um, sometimes we do it very quickly, and then it happened that the, the device come out from the tip of the scope very quickly and might traumatize the, um, the wall, the colonic wall, um, leading to a perforation. In ex it's, it's, it's very ex uh, rare and extreme perforation. So, but we always have to take care of these things. Um, uh, for the gastroscopy, the perforation is uh, even uh, more um, uncommon than for colonoscopy. Uh, perforation rate is one out of 2,500 to 11,000 um, based on the uh, literature. And the predisposing factor are mostly Zenker diverticulum uh, or anterior cervical osteophytes or stricture. Um, bleeding. Uh, is uh, again a very rare adverse event for uh, um, during diagnostic endoscopy. Uh, it's mainly caused in upper GI endoscopy by Mallory Weiss or, or a, a patient with uh, uh, thrombocytopenia or coagulopathies. Now, something that in my, uh, you might have experienced um, is that there is a good percentage of patients that after colonoscopy complains of abdominal pain. This is very common, but it becomes a complication if the patient is admitted. If the patient goes on and then from the hospital and say, oh, I have this pain, you, you know, you recommend some paracetamol or bascopan and then the pain resolves, that's not a complication. Um, but if the patient comes back to the hospital because the pain is unbearable, then these become a complication. And you always think about perforation, if you had a resection about a post-polypectomy syndrome, or as happened many a time, and this is the major cause of abdominal pain, is some air uh, trap in the uh, bowel. Um, splenic rupture is uh, very uncommon. So post-polypectomy syndrome usually starts Afterward, straight after the colonoscopy, but can happen also 
a uh, few hours afterwards or a few days after the coronic rejection. Um, the patient initially um, complains of abdominal pain, and uh, which is quite intense, I have to say, and it can get worse and it can cause uh, fever and peritoneal signs. Uh, you might have leukocytosis and uh, a raise a CRP, but when you perform the CT scan, and we, in our hospital, when we have a suspect of perforation, nowadays we only perform CT scan. We don't perform um, X-rays because the CT scan are much more reliable. Then the CT scan in this case will be negative. So you might think about post-polypectomy uh, syndrome. And these happen mostly when we reject polyp on the right colon when we have a polyp bigger than 20 millimeter in size, although even for a smaller polyp, when you use diathermy, might happen that patient might have post polypectomy syndrome. It's, it's uh, more common when you have multiple um, polyps resected uh, throughout the colon, and if the procedure takes longer, and uh, of course, if the polyp are sessile, flat, uh, sorry, flat rather than polypoid or pedunculated. Um, how do we manage post-polypectomy syndrome? So we uh, usually admit the patients, IV fluids, antibiotics, bowel rest, and usually in 24 hours, the patient feels better and improve, and then you are able to discharge them. Now, um, I, I will fire a question to you now, if anyone is um, keen to comment. Um, this is what is it? This is this happen after uh, resection. So if anyone wants to make a comment, I'm not sure if you are able to. Um, if no one wants to step forward, then of course this is a target sign, okay, which we, was this. We do have yep. a, a comment at uh, the ESD. Yes, uh, this is this is probably done by EMR because it's a small poly, but this looks like a, it. Well, it's a target sign, so-called target sign that was described by Michael Berg initially. So as you can see in the resection in this submucosal part uh, of the resected specimen, there is this whitish area, which is uh, actually a muscle layer. So, and if you look at the endoscopic images, that this is a a um, defect in the muscle layer. So what you want to do it here is to place, as it was uh, correctly done, to place some clip um, to completely close the defect. And it is important that you completely close the um, this uh, white area because if you don't close it, then in few hours the patient will develop a transmural perforation and will be admitted to the hospital. So this is. That means, as we said initially, a prompt response to early signs of perforation, okay? So um, this is actually a, a full thickness perforation. And as you can see here around the perforation side, there is still a, a polyp left. Um, so the question here is, what would you do? Would you carry on with the perforate with the with the resection or would you close the perforation and then send the person for surgery so does anyone want to respond i'll give you a few seconds ready let me know if anyone will uh, type something in i am monitoring yes, yes. it reflect and then close sorry said again Resect and then close. Yes, and that's exactly what has been done. So the rest of the poly has been uh, completely resected and then fully closed. But uh, I mean, this is really uh, depends on, on the patient conditions because if the patient is uh, under GA or you have these complications, this perforation that the patient is fine, then yes, please carry on finish to remove the polyp and then close the defect because you will achieve both the result of uh, completely res complete resection of the polyp and uh, 
perforation management. But if the patient is in pain and is screaming and is under sedation and cannot bear the pain, etc., then you might need to close the defect first and then try to come down the, the patient, give it more sedation, and then try to continue with the resection if it's possible. Um, and this is a, a video um, from uh, Dr. Uh, Paul. So they had this rectal lesion, LSTG. Uh, I found it on uh, um, video GIE. And then they resected the, the, the polyp and they found the perforation. They finished with the, uh, res the whole um, resection. You can see this is a transmural perforation. And then they place few clips to close the defect. So this is a, a very interesting um, uh, videos because it shows us that when you close such a deep defect, one to one to achieve is not just have the having the um, margin of the resection side closer. You need to clip not only the mucosa but the muscle layer from the edges of the resection side and sometimes also the serosa within you need to catch all of that within your clips because if you only catch the mucosal layer and close them then it will be much more diff well we, it's not going to be an effective uh, um, closure and the the patient might still experience pain so so the, the learning point here from this video is to achieve a full thickness closure now, perforation, uh, management of perforation, of course, when you are in a procedure where you still have to resect part of the polyp and you have a perforation, what you want to do is reduce the uh, CO2 content of the colon, so suck the air, as uh, my Japanese uh, colleagues were also told me, um, and uh, bring the fluids away from the lesion Give to the patient to the patient some IV uh, antiperistaltic agents as bascopan, so that uh, these won't interfere. Uh, the, the the peristalsis won't interfere with uh, um, the the resection and the perforation closure. And uh, and uh, finally, once resected, apply the clips as we saw. <clears throat> if the patient have a perforation, whether it's uh, uh, a delayed perforation, which many a times happen that as we saw, patient might come back to the hospital with abdominal pain or might develop this pain after a few hours for the perforation. They usually develop abdominal uh, severe pain, distension, tenders, and guarding. Um, vital sign may be normal or they might have some tachycardia and they might develop fever. And for this reason, you need to give them uh, a broad spectrum antibiotics, and uh, you need to again uh, organize an urgent CT scan and uh, involve uh, the surgical team as soon as possible. Because even if the surgeon uh, won't operate on the patient, or even if you think that the patient is doing well after you started your, you know, all the antibiotics and you gave them the <clears throat> anti the, the painkillers. Um, it's always better to involve the surgeon so that at least they are aware of this patient in the hospital. Um, now, this is a, we change the topic now from perforation, we uh, go ahead with bleeding. This was a, a sickle lesion that uh, we found uh, in, the, in one of our patients at the Royal Free Hospital. So you can see the endoscopic view on your right and on your left, you have a little diagram, which was, uh, draw by Professor Iano from uh, Gigi Medical Center, who ha we had the pleasure to have him with us for three months recently. And here, as you see, is how when we are injecting underneath the lesion. This procedure was done by my uh, friend and uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Edward Despot. We worked very closely um, together. So Ed was uh, uh, starting resecting these uh, LST uh, granular uh, type, and uh, after the first uh, resection, there was uh, some uh, uh, bleeding here. Uh, and uh, decided to, because the bleeding was not significant, 
he rightly decided to uh, go ahead with the perforation. As you can see here for the graph, he proceed with the resection. Now we found that he had some more space to um, try to stop the bleeding. So he tried with the coagulation, but it didn't work very well. But he is also aware of the fact that if there's a place a clip, then he will probably make the resection even um, more difficult. So he decided to carry on with the resection. And, um, and so he's, he's carry on resecting piecemeal. Uh, and then you, I, will, I move a bit forward. You will see here that as almost finished is a resection. He find the bleeding point very easily. He has all the all the space. He put a few clips. He stop the bleeding, and then he complete his resection. Okay, so everything was handled very well. As we say, this is not a complication. This is an incident, right? But it then became a complication the day after, because the day after happened that unfortunately the patient came back to the hospital, and uh, that on that day I was in endoscopy. So I took care of this uh, complication. I could see the bleeding point, and um, which I thought it was there. I put a clip. But unfortunately, my clip didn't work very well. Although it was close to the bleeding point, it was the uh, lesion was still bleeding. And at that time, uh, we had uh, um, uh, Professor Riano from Gigi Medical University at uh, our uh, hospital. And uh, they, uh, Professor Riano worked very close with Professor Yamamoto. And uh, they recently came up with a gel immersion technique where they use uh, a special viscous solution uh, to find the bleeding point. Because as you see from this video, with water, we were not able to pinpoint the exact bleeding point. And uh, I'll uh, skip qu quickly uh, to the important point, which is around here, where we inject some uh, gel, this viscous solution inside the working channel and because it's a viscous solution, it reduces the bleeding, and we are able to clearly identify the bleeding point and place one resolutive clip. As you know, when you place a clip, it's very important that you place the clip in the proper place. So I always ask my um, nurses, I will always double check with them the order. So open, close, fire, release. So I open, I close, I make sure here that the clip is placed in the right um, spot and this, the bleeding has stopped. Now we release the clip and eventually the bleeding is uh, under control. Um, so this is a very good, I think, demonstration of how to handle the bleeding. Um, and also it's the, it also I like the fact that the saline immersion using the special gel, which is uh, um, commercialized in Japan now, but it will be commercialized in Europe, in, due, in uh, all over the world, hopefully in due course, it's extremely useful uh, for this kind of situation. So what you do when you have a uh, um, bleeding following a colorectal EMR or ESD. So if the patient is in your unit, first of all, you stop the bleeding. If the patient come back, as it happened, you check also the hemoglobin. Uh, if the patient needs transfusion, you give him transfusion, you admit the patient, you check for uh, um, hemodynamic uh, stability. And, and then uh, we tend to, if we know that the patient had a resection, which will, we, we tend to repeat the colonoscopy as soon as possible. Um, if, uh, or the other option uh, is to wait and see, because most of this bleeding resolve within 24 hours spontaneously. But I think, um, sometimes when you perform ESD or resection and you have this kind of bleeding and the patient came back with a delay perforation, with a delay bleeding, it's, it's more um, sensible to uh, repeat the colonoscopy because you might have a significant bleeding which won't stop uh, spontaneously. Um, immediate polypectomy bleeding are around 2-3%. 
uh, and uh, of course they increase with the, incre with the increasing size of the EMR um, uh, resection. And uh, the delayed bleeding is around uh, 9 uh, to 13% for every millimeter in polyp diameter I found in the literature. Um, does anyone has any question about resection or, or perforation or bleeding? Dr. Okay, Molina, the, the video that you've showed uh, from Dr. Paul, um, the, the tools that they've used, are those commercially available at all? Uh, was about the resection or about the... Um, I believe it was about the resection, yes. Uh, I mean, they 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 used um, a cap, uh, which is commercially available, um, and then they use uh, a snare, um, which is commercially available, as as well as the clips. So yes, all of them are commercially available. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so, yeah. The so the the other question is, uh, why did you choose clip over coagulation grasper? That, that's that's a very good point. Um, so I remember on that case, I was discussing this with uh, Professor Yano when I was doing the colonoscopy. And I was saying, shall we go for a clip? Shall we go with for a coagrasper? <clears throat> we decided to go for a clip because the, the point of bleeding was bang in front of us. We couldn't um, uh, fail. And uh, it was... Um, very easy to place a clip, so that's why I decided to go for for Eclipse. But a quagrasper might be also a, a good option. Um, absolutely. Actually, the guidelines, international guidelines, usually recommend two uh, kind of uh, um, uh, two kind of treatment. So usually, a combined treatment is preferred, either injection therapy. Uh, with adrenaline and then coagrasper or, you know, gold probe or maybe injection therapy and then clips. But we're very sure that we would have been curative. So may, may I move on? The, yes. the, if, if for the complication of bleeding for resection polyps, what intervention can, can be done for those? Okay, um, so the question is about uh, the how to handle the the bleeding after EMR, Correct. after addiction. Correct. Yes. So um, if the the bleeding happened during the uh, procedure, so during the EMR, um, you usually or during the SD you usually, you can treat the bleeding with the tip of the snare or with a uh, knife uh, within coagulation mode. Uh, so you need to really identify the, the bleeding point. So use the water jet. It's very important. If you have the cap, the cap is also very important because when you have a bleeding, sometimes it's difficult to find where it comes from. And if you have a cap on your scope, you can um, apply some pressure on the around the bleeding point, this, because of the pressure, will stop or partially stop the, the bleeding. You will be able to spot where the bleeding coming, is coming from. And then while you um, put in pressure on that area of the mucosa, you can then use the, the device to stop the bleeding. Um, so you, you can use, as we say, tip of the scope, uh, the, the, the knife on coagulation mode or uh, the coagrasper. And nowadays you use the coagrasper during DSD if you fail to control it with the tip of the knife. The other, other things that might be uh, useful are, of course, the clip and the worst, worst case scenario when you're not able to um, handle a bleeding is hemospray. At least it gives you a transient control of the bleeding as a bridge, and then you could rescope the, the, the patient the day after. But to be frank, I never had to use the EMO spray to stop, to stop a bleeding related to EMR or ESD. Never happened to me. Um, shall we move forward? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marina.
Okay, so this is a, a, a video, interesting video of a dilatation that I uh, found on internet. Um, you can, it's it's a dilatation of an esophageal restriction in a patient with achalasia that was uh, treated with a, a Rigiflex balloon, which um, in general has an increased risk of perforation. And you can see here, the, compared to the CRE balloon, you can see here that there is a, a perforation uh, on the left side uh, of the esophagus. So now esophageal perforation is something that is extremely um, stressful to handle. And, um, and so here the question is what you do after you have an esophageal perforation. And I go straight to this slide because first of all, if you recognize the esophageal perforation, you might want to try to close it with an ovesco or with a clips, but it's quite difficult, especially if the patient is not on their GA. And please bear in mind that in Europe, in majority of the hospital in Europe, we use still conscious sedation. So if this is the case, it's more difficult to place the clip or to close it with an ovesco. Um, if you fail to close the perforation, and that one that I show you was quite a large perforation, then uh, you um, need to uh, perform, to give to the patient straight away antibiotics. So starting on antibiotics, uh, and then he, if he needs to have an urgent CT scan of his chest with an oral uh, contrast so that you are Sure, that is a, a, a transmural perforation. That looked like a transmural perforation, but you might have smaller perforation that you're not sure. So CT scan with transoral contrast and start the patient on a, a painkiller. So it's like um, codeine uh, or uh, fentanyl or uh, because uh, I'm afraid, but um, paracetamol won't be enough. Uh, of course, you need to involve the surgical team as soon as possible. And then uh, you also, and, but this is very, uh, it varies. So someone plays a nasogastric um, tube uh, so that all the secretion are aspirated. And also in many hospitals, a nasoesophageal tube is inserted with a continuous aspiration so that all secretion and saliva are um, are sucked, uh, but it's also important that that's one of the most important things actually. The patient needs to fast, so kneel by mouth, nothing. You might want the patient if you cannot place a nasoesophageal tube with a continuous aspiration. You can ask the patient to spit out the saliva and try not to swallow the saliva. Bear in mind that uh, this is. Uh, for the patient, a very, very tough situation because the patient will stay in the hospital at least for seven days because he needs to take antibiotic for seven days and then he needs to have a repeat CT scan with barium, uh, sorry, with uh, oral contrast uh, after seven days to check if the perforation is healed and is closed. So again, he, and we come back here to the best friend rule. So. No matter if you're covering the ward or not, go back to the to the ward and uh, see the the patient every day, every day. And um, usually, in this case, uh, we um, the, it needs to have um, gram, sorry, a, a full broad a broad spectrum antibiotic uh, cover. Um, now. Always uh, ask the surgeon to review him uh, every day as well. The other point here uh, for this patient is uh, in some hospital, they place stent after a perforation. In other hospital, the stent is not placed. I think, and the guidelines here are a bit contradictory. So someone suggests the stent to be placed, other guidelines do not recommend the stent. So um, this is a, a gray area. I can tell you that, uh, for example, in my hospital, we don't play extent um, in these cases anymore because the surgeon don't recommend it. Um, but it's always better to double check with them. Now, 
let's move on from the esophageal perforation and uh, quickly go through the PEG. So PEG is a very common um, procedure that uh, we do basically every day in the hospital. It's quite straightforward, but it has many risks. And the, the, risk, the risk rate is around 5 to 10% and can be serious in uh, um, up to 9% of the cases. Those include aspiration, bleeding, injury to internal organs, perforation, barry bumper syndrome, uh, wood infection, necrosite lymphocytes, and uh, uh, death. Um, so it is very important specifically to avoid any infection and for the necrosite lymphocytes, which can cause death, to give the patient a prophylactic antibiotic. Uh, therapy. Uh, and this, uh, this is extremely important and also you need to make sure that the, all the anticoagulants has been stopped and the ENR, INR is less than 1.5. Um, you want to check that there is a transillumination and uh, also adequate uh, uh, finger indentation. Uh, I have a video here about uh, Barry Bumper syndrome. Uh, so this was a patient that, that, uh, that uh, this is uh, the, the bumper of the peg, which was buried in uh, granulation tissue. And here we use uh, new devices. We, this, um, we recently published on GIE uh, multi-center study about that. So you insert this flamingo device, which is like a... Um, um, sphincterotome-like shape uh, through the peg externally, through a guide wire. And once it is uh, um, inserted, you will see now coming it from um, in the stomach, from the endoscopic view. And we're doing this procedure under sedation. Uh, so you handle this uh, um, device externally, so you need two operators, one that controls endoscopically the scope and the other one then uh, control the flamingo device. The flamingo device is here, you bend it, there is a, here a cutting wire divider, device and with a wire uh, you cut following a stellar, uh, a star shape uh, in order to cut the granulation tissue and then to release the bumper. And here, I move forward, at some point, you will see that the bumper became visible. Here, you see that the bumper became visible, and externally, you push the bumper in the stomach and then remove it with the scope. See? And this was a very, um, uh, you, it's a very useful device. Now, I'm going to finish in a few minutes just to say capsule endoscopy, very safe. Uh, procedure, the only risk are retentions and aspiration. Retention usually is caused by uh, strictures that many a times happen in IBD patient. Many a times the capsule pass through the stricture with laxative or spontaneously. In IBD patient, if the strictures are inflammatory, then uh, medical management should be given to the patient so that the, 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 the stricture here, the inflammation reduces, and then the capsule can pass through the stricture and, and um, you know, naturally uh, excreted. Um, aspiration mostly happen in uh, um, elderly patient uh, or patient with a swollen disorder. Remember, if you have an aspiration, the first thing you want to do is have good interscapular blows to promote coughing cuff, and a good and. Um, expulsion of the capsule, but if doesn't if this doesn't happen, then you need to organize a bronchoscopy. Um, device assisted enteroscopy. Uh, I am referring mostly to balloon assisted enteroscopy. Are extremely safe. You have the uh, complication usually when you do resection of large polyps or dilatation of small bowel strictures. Other complications are mucosal damage, abdominal pain, which are mainly very, um, very mild. And uh, acute pancreatitis, there is uh, uh, always this thing on top of uh, our 
head or what about acute pancreatitis? I can tell you that it's extremely rare. In literature, it has been reported as 0.3% of the complication. In my personal experience, and I've done hundreds of enteroscopies with double balloon, um, I've never read it, touch wood, uh, but uh, it's extremely safe, okay? So, um, conclusion. The conclusion is, remember, complications occur, so please be ready to face the complication, because no matter what you do, you will have some complication. Complication is important, and you need to recognize it very, uh, I mean, as, as soon as you can, and uh, have a plan in place, and uh, promptly react. Communication with the patient is important before the procedure, once you have the complication, and after when you are treating the complication, if the patient is hospitalized. Learn from complication, because this will give you a lot of learning point, you will grow uh, a lot as an endoscopy uh, while you manage your complication and share your complication. Share your complication with your colleagues, share your complication with your fellows. It's an important teaching point, both for you and for other colleagues. So share your experience as much as you can. Thank you. Thank you all of you for, you know, um, listen to this uh, uh, webinar. Um, again, many thanks for inviting me. And a big thank you to all my endoscopy team here for the, the amazing work that we've done in endoscopy during the pandemic, from the porters to the fellow, to the nurse, everyone involved, to the front desk. It has been a dreadful year. And uh, thank you to all the endoscopists uh, and uh, endoscopy unit staff out there that many times have been redeployed in, all, in other wars to help during the pandemic. Thank you. Wow, Dr. Marino, thank you for the excellent presentation. Um, the audience is, is ready with some questions for you, but I just want a, a quick reminder, um, if you have any questions, please use the question box in the GoToWebinar panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, Dr. Marino, you, that, that, pic, that last picture that you showed with, with your staff was, uh, was amazing. And, Earlier, you mentioned you mentioned that uh, best friend role and and the second victim concept by, by Dr. Wu. Um, the question is, how important is the supporting staff in in managing complications? So it's 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 crucial. Uh, it's crucial, and um, but this is the this is something. Uh, um, if, if you by supporting staff mean if we have the proper support as a physician when we face this complication, I'm not sure if we have it, to be frank, because it's something that has, you know, we are now discussing about these things, but before it has been very recently described, although 2000 is 21 years ago, but that was the first time, but now people is starting to talk about this more and more often. And um, when I had my first complication, it was an esophageal perforation, um, and I handled the complication myself, I felt very guilty for, for the patient. And uh, I was lucky enough to have uh, colleagues with the hospital to discuss about it, and, um, and colleague also um, that I really, um, you know, take into consideration where I was discussing over the phone. And this is important for your mental health, but also to check if you've done everything right for the patient or you need to add something to his uh, um, therapy or his management. Thank you for sharing that experience. And, and which brings me to my next point, you mentioned mental health and this is more a question, a personal question for you. What are you have to have a, a strong mindset to to handle these complications? Are you, what are some of the techniques that you use to to have this this uh, strong mindset and this mental health to to be able to uh, to 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 stay composed during during a complication? Uh, that's not easy. <laughs> I think it's something that you gain with experience um what, what i so first of all the first things that i have on my mind when i need to deal with a complication um when when this occur is that if i get worried or stressed this won't 
help with the complication. It will resolve the complication. So there is no point to uh, freak out, basically. Um, so that's one. The second thing, uh, it's important, as we say, to have a, a plan in place so that you know that you're doing this procedure and you have organized everything even for the complication. So you know that you know, the uh, surgeons knows that you're doing this procedure, you are in theater, if this procedure were extremely, you know, risky, so you are in a protected environment, the patient is under GA, if it was a risky, a risky procedure, that you have your team with you, so uh, dedicated nurses which are experienced and they can help you with this uh, complication. And of course, you know, knowing that you have uh, other colleagues, experienced colleagues with you in your team also help you because many a times, as I were, as I said, I work very closely with uh, with that despot. We work closely together. When we face complication, it face complication, I face complication with um, several, many a times we call each other uh, to uh, support. So also this thing is very important. The working team, it's, it's uh, um, extremely important. Thank you. I, I totally agree with you that you do need a strong support, supportive team. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that feedback again. The going back to the esophageal stricture dilation, um, one question that came through the chat box was: what is the ideal time to start radiotherapy for squamous cell carcinoma after esophageal perforation treat is treated with FC SEMS? Well, um, I, I'm not an expert in uh, radiotherapy, so it's difficult to me to give a, a, a precise answer to that. I guess that uh, you at least need to, um, to resolve the perforation first, but you, know, you have to keep in mind that when you have a perforation of a, an esophageal cancer, um, it has a very poor outcomes. So many a time the patient ended up having a surgery or um, or in a, another kind of, uh, or maybe a stent place um, because um, conservative management, it's many a time not very helpful in this, in this patient. So uh, I think you need to, the, the, the perforation needs to be fully managed first, and then probably you need to discuss with your radiotherapist when is the exact, uh, the ideal moment to start uh, a radiotherapy and if it's safe. Dr. Mino, thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Your experience is, is invaluable, and I'm, I'm glad that you shared it with all of us. Uh, before we, we close out, I will launch a very quick poll to check the quality of this presentation. And uh, your experience with, with this learning event is very important to ASG. We want to make sure we are offering interactive sessions like this one that feature educational needs. Um, ASG staff will also send a very brief survey about this session, which takes less than a minute to complete. Uh, be on the lookout for that uh, probably tomorrow around this time. Um, I will leave the poll open for just a few more seconds. And as, as another reminder, please do check ASG's